The Cleveland Guardians have added eight more prospects to their system. We're going to talk about where these guys slot in. You're going to get a chance to find out about these eight new players, as well as how did the state of Ohio do on day two of the draft? We're halfway through. Day three tomorrow, 10 more players coming in. But where do things stand with the Cleveland Indians' current draft class? All on today's Locked On Guardians. <laughs> You are Locked On Guardians, your daily podcast on the Cleveland Guardians, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Locked On Guardians. I'm your host, Jeff Ellis. Before this, I was a draft analyst. That was my primary thing. Also prospects, but mostly the draft for Scout in 24-7 for about five years there. Uh, unfortunately, before Scout gave, uh, well, Scout ran out of money in 24-7. Uh, never had any interest in baseball, let's be honest. That's what happened there. Uh, it was, I, I do look back, like that. that's the high point with Scout. Scout was at a time where they were spending money and really, looking to promote their own internal stuff and uh they did some really cool things we're ahead of the time it just unfortunately did not come together but it it was a a fantastic opportunity uh, where i met some fantastic people so the draft is half over it's weird to say that like when i start i've been doing this for 14 years uh before i go deeper i want to take a moment and say uh you know thank you for making lockdown guardians your first listen today and every day wherever you get podcasts 14 years (laughs) i've been doing this some of the early ones are not good uh, I'd have to go, like, you know, like, for instance, you know, I know uh, my braggadociousness has become a joke uh, now because I made such a big deal out of it, but there was a point in time where, like, I, I had to learn the lesson, Let, let's not compare guys to Hall of Famers. <laughs> that was something I did. I, I distinctly remember that. And that's one of those things where I look back and just kind of go, oh, my goodness, what was I doing? Or just the things I didn't know, right? You've been doing it for 14 years. I go back and I look, uh, you know, I just remember it was like on a lark that I wrote every profile for Tony over at uh, Indians Baseball Insider. And I just one day took it upon myself. I had a day off from work. Um, when I lived in New York City, I taught at a school for children with autism. We operated our space uh, from a Jewish, from a synagogue and was owned by a Jewish couple. So we got all the Jewish holidays off. Uh, so I hope that's all appropriate. If I said something wrong, please let me know. I, I don't know line crossing with certain things. Uh, I, I'm always learning. But uh, the draft fell on that holiday in June in one year. So I just got to sit there and do it back when all rounds of the draft were in the afternoon. And was it just two days? I feel like it was, two, or I don't think it was all in one day. I feel like it was maybe over two. I can't recall, but it was 50 rounds <laughs> that I wrote up all of them. And I just remember I'd sit there and like, they'd announce a pick, I'd tweet out some information. And then I would start writing up a player. And then they would announce the next pick, and I would write down that guy's name. And if I knew that guy right then and there, I would do that profile. If I didn't, I'd go back to the last guy. And every time I got done, I would send it off to Andrew Zajac, often, or uh, Steve Orbanks, or Hayden Grove, uh, over, you know, who's, who's big time now. If I would pass that information on to them, they would do the final bits of editing, post and upload. And about an hour after the draft, I think I'd be all caught up. But even when I got the National Gig at Scout, I kept doing that. So as I was like... I remember one time I was going to go see a buddy in Chicago and I'm like quickly trying to write up like division by division reviews and send them off to Melissa Lockhart, like the best person ever in the baseball industry as far as I've met. And she would edit and post before eventually I just took over the site for my own and could do that all. Uh, it was fun times. But yeah, I looking at tomorrow, I mean, like there's only 10 rounds. Like after doing 50, it's just so easy nowadays. It is comically easy in that regard. I'm like, I'm, I'm done after 10. Yeah, and they were moving quick picks quickly today tomorrow it's even faster like in the past it's always like conference call and like you know on day every player gets kind of a shout out on day two like because it's it's there's a little bit of time it is it's early boom 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 you know this team reference number boom next one reference like then there's a break like you don't even hear like callus and mayo and seth braun for the longest time uh so if you plan on watching it I'll, it's very different tomorrow but i don't know i have some very fond memories it's it, when I land of, you know, I love Locked On and I love everything they've done, but landing that scout gig and that being the first time I ever got paid to write, uh, you know, outside of like making a few bucks in June just for the draft, but having a regular paycheck, being a national guy, all of a sudden doing like 30 radio interviews at draft, 
and you know being on ESPN radio like that nothing's gonna top that that's that's a for in terms of my writing that's that's probably gonna be the career highlight unless a team hires me and I'll just throw it out there you know, Chicago White Sox we didn't agree early on but again day two lined up with that team so well let's get into the Ohio kids before we talk about like where these guys might slot in talk about like the guardian system and then just start talking I don't know if we're gonna get to all eight today that's fine we got the rest of the week there's no baseball a home run derby, Jose lost in round one, like uh, to the eventual champion. That's about all we got to say. I'm not going to watch the All-Star game. I haven't in a bit since I was a kid, which is, it's weird as a kid, like I adored it, but I think it's just because I didn't have like cable or anything like that. It was sometimes the only time in a year where like, that's when I got to see Tony Gwynn, like it was things like that. There's the, the rarity of the situation uh, made it all the greater when I was younger think so but yeah we're gonna focus on the draft the next few days and then i'm just gonna be honest with you listeners i've done a lot of episodes now because i'm traveling to ohio i'm gonna go see family Uh, my dad i've talked about you know he's doing better he's finally gonna meet his grandson so that's gonna be exciting his first grandson ever he hasn't met him yet he's 11 month old uh so we're gonna go do that family stuff so next week is mostly gonna be dark i've got my episodes i've done so many now with the bonus in the draft that it's gonna be dark next week so i'm gonna apologize for that now Let's talk Ohio. So I thought it was fantastic. The first Ohio um, college player went from Notre Dame College in Ohio. And here's what's fun about that. I was not familiar with Notre Dame College in Cleveland. I didn't know it was a Cleveland school. Uh, Someone kind of alerted me to that. I wish I could give credit. But Ben Ross, the shortstop, and there was the first college kid taken from the state of Ohio. So you have your first college kid from the state of Ohio is from Notre Dame College in Cleveland. They retweeted something when I was like, I'm not familiar with the program. Uh, They were very tongue in cheek, very cool about the fact some people could have been offended by that, but they were not. So that was fantastic. TJ Brock from Ohio State went uh, in the sixth round of the Blue Jays, fastball slider, a relief type. I thought, you know, he's probably he's a senior sign type, but he he had some, some chatter a year ago. That was a nice get. Jonathan Brand from Miami of Ohio, I didn't realize he was supposed to go to Auburn. That was one of those things I was sitting there seeing it. Uh, my buddy Lindsay at Lockdown Prospects talked about, oh no, Auburn, we're not getting him. I didn't know know that he had another year left. Undersized guy, unbelievable numbers, had an ERA under one and a half at Miami of Ohio. So good on him that he gets drafted here. I thought that was a lot of fun to see him get drafted because he's 5'9". Like it didn't matter how good he was. It is hard to get drafted when you are a 5'9 right-handed pitcher. So that was awesome. Uh, I know uh, Michael Turner, I don't know if he counts, but I think he should because Michael Turner is, like, he's going to be 24 in a month, catcher, uh, Arkansas, and was good for them in the postseason. But before that, he was at Kent State for four years, five years. Like, he was Kent State's catcher for every year until this year. I think it might be the White Sox actually drafted him now that I say this. Uh, but yeah, he was, he was an Ohio guy for, for a long time, might is he the one from Warren? I could be wrong, but he's, or maybe he's from, uh, he's from Ohio, but it, it was good to see that. Like, technically he's not going to be on the Ohio list, but it, it was nice to see that Ohio kid there. And then the other guys you have to talk about are Kyle Jones, twins again, hitting Ohio. That is two Ohio guys from Toledo. He's always uh, had good walk rates. We started missing bats this year, and I was reading reports from people uh, the Fabio system, I, I should give credit to the guy who invented it. It's really interesting, uh, very deep dive analytical. He loved Jones. like, And there's some stuff about increase other places in terms of his stuff. It seems like a nice get in the seventh round, more than just a senior sign maybe for the Twins with Kyle Jones from Toledo. And then Matt Broski, Broski, uh, big Nick Swisher fan. I'm kidding. Nick Swisher did read a draft pick in round two if you missed it, uh, I believe for the Yankees. But Broski from Youngstown State, started OU though, so you got multiple connections there. Four-year player, fastball slider, maybe a reliever. Okay, so I, and one of the reasons Texas drafted him is because of, I I made some text here, so just, you know, victory lap coming. Just just so my my friends know this, you don't get upset. Victory lap coming. So the last thing before we go to break is, I was going over stuff last night. I ended up at like 1.30 in the morning. I was talking with my good buddy Taylor Blake Ward, name drop. And right before that, I was talking with Bryce from Locked on Rangers to be like, hey, he was very depressed. Uh, I was trying to make him feel better. And I'm like, you know, I was looking at the money. I think they can sign Brock Porter. And I then had to explain who Brock Porter was because 
not everyone's into the draft. That's, you know, I mean, to me, it, it does reflect a little bit on your character. I'm kidding. <laughs> to everyone, whatever their like is, is their like. But I called it and I tweeted it last night about 1130 uh, Central Time. I go, I'm calling my shot now. Brock Porter is going to the Rangers. And it, it's a it's a big shot to call because the Rangers didn't have a second or third round pick. Right. They lost those for signing free agents. That's why they had the 14th biggest pool in spite of having a top three selection. So he had to get all the way through the third round with no one popping him. Couldn't have a, a Judd Fabian situation. And he got he got there and Texas got him. And Texas actually took like three or four interesting players in a row there. And Broski was one of the guys that's probably a, a low end senior sign who's going to help him get there. But yeah, uh, victory lap, you know, as it says up there coming just to warn our friends who get tired of him. But the victory lap is, I successfully predicted Brock uh, Porter to Texas in the fourth round. The biggest name left in the draft. If you're curious, my big board, I'll close the text, you can actually see it, that's going behind me. My co-host also wants to take a victory lap, apparently. Say hi to the crowd. Uh, all 51 players selected. Uh, all that was left to start the day was Trey Dombrowski and Brock Porter. Dombrowski went to Houston. And, you know, Houston continued to have a really strong draft, much to my annoyance. And then I had a just miss. Like, the guys I considered, but for various reasons, just didn't get in there. Uh, and I, listen, I didn't know how many players I put in there until I was sitting there and I counted them today. 69 players. Wish I could say I was aiming for a joke. I'm not. Uh, instead, that's just how many guys were still left on the board in terms of guys that entered consideration either before the year began what I, I mean okay so the list went very deeper but these are the guys that i was like okay if i was to keep going these are the names i would look at uh, these are the ones that i really want to talk about 68 out of 69 guys drafted tristan smith the lieutenant pitcher committed to clemson from uh boland i want to say is the only player left so yeah it's a it's a deep draft it's been a interesting draft we're going to go guardians targets we're going to get into maybe how they'd slot into the system. And then we're not going to get to all the players today. But here's my promise for segment three. You want to stick around because I'm going to give you the best names. And the guys that really stood out to me might be a little immature. But it's going to be the best names in this year's class. Top five names for me on today's episode of Locked on Guardians. Our first fantastic sponsor are our good friends over at BlueNile.com. By now you should know them, you should not love them. They've been one of our most consistent sponsors. So someone is doing us the grand favor of going there. And if you want fine jewelry, you are, want wedding jewelry, you're not actually doing us a favor going there. You're doing yourself the favor because they have original pieces. And you know, they're the first uh, company to be the online jeweler. They started with this idea. This is where it really began. And you know they are there to support you through every step of the process. doesn't matter if it's engagement rings, if it's fine jewelry. Whoever you want to make jewelry for it, they will help you. They will handcraft it, and they have support 24-7 to help you make a original, beautiful piece. It's not just, you know, this. it's not going to be like you're going to go to the mall and walk around and see three people wearing the Jane Seymour thing from K. Is that still a thing? I don't know. This is an original piece of jewelry. If you're going to spend money, spend money on quality, right? That's... That's what you want to do. And make your moments sparkle with jewelry from BlueNile.com. And going on now is the Blue Nile anniversary sale. Save up to 40%. That's one of the highest discounts we've ever had from one of our uh, advertisers on classic fine jewelry pieces and 25% on engagement settings. Plus, every order is insured, ships free, and arrives in discreet packaging that won't give away what's inside. Shop, shop stress-free and find your forever piece at BlueNile.com today. Hey, let's just do the names, right? I haven't even talked about the guys the Guardians drafted. So in the fourth round, they took Joe Lampy, an outfielder, probably a center fielder from Arizona State, followed it up with Nate Furman, a second baseman, maybe an outfielder from UNC Charlotte, then Guy Limsicum Jr. from Belmont, an outfielder, then uh, Dylan DeLucia from Ole Miss, and the sixth and the seventh, Javier Santos, from a right-handed pitcher from the Georgia Premier Academy, Eighth is Jackson Humphreys from Fuquay Varina High School in North Carolina, left-handed pitcher. Then we had Austin Peterson, left-handed or right-handed pitcher. I'm sorry, out of Connecticut. I could have, I should have predicted him. He is the most Guardians pitcher in this class. We'll get to that. And the last round, a shocker, kind of Jacob Zibin, a Canadian kid who was at the TNX Tell Academy in Florida. Let's put it this way. 
Jacob Zibin and Jackson Humphreys are both 17. Jackson Humphreys on Wednesday will be 18. Okay, so he's one of the youngest players in this class, but he's turning 18 on Wednesday. Jacob Zibin won't turn 18 until 2023. His birthday is January. He is he, I don't know if he's the youngest player in this class, but he's got to be darn near if he isn't. Uh, very young player, interesting guy. Technically, he could have qualified. He could have spent two years. He, he could have stayed at the TNXL Academy for another year because, like, the Canada five-year rule and been eligible as a high schooler next year, too. That's, that's the situation he was in. Uh, so, you know, you have those players. I had a lot of people ask, where do these guys slot into the top 10? And here's my problem with slotting anyone in the top 10. So if we just talk about the Cleveland Guardians' top 10 prospects, you know, as I've done many times, you know, we have Espino, Williams, Valera, Jones, Brennan, because I think he qualifies, Bo Naylor, as he's destroying baseballs left and right, uh, Brian Rocchio, Gabriel Arias, Ty Freeman, Logan Allen. That's 10. You know how many of those guys are in the lower minors? Zero. Those are all players who are in double A or higher. Uh, what about John Kenzie Noel, who's put on an absolute display of power? He's got to be in that next group. Jose Tenya, who dominated Arizona, probably in that next group. Tanner Burns, having a good year. Next group. Petey Halpin, really interesting. Yeah, probably that next group. Uh, what happens if Cody Morris is healthy and able to pitch? Yeah. Oh, uh, Brian Levestito, wasn't he in your top 10? Should he be? Yeah, he probably should be somewhere in that next group. That's like six guys in the next five. So, you know, you can go, like, if I, I pulled up MLB's list while I'm talking, and I'm just going through and looking at this, and I'm like, Joey Cantillo and Will Brennan are 30th and 28th. Like, that's not going to stay. But I go through this, it's like Tanner Bybee at 29. He's going to move up. Gabriel Rodriguez at 27 is probably going to move down or off. Nick Miklojak might move off. It's been an up-and-down year. Isaiah Green's playing well. He's up. Tolentino up. Jake Fox is up. Ethan Hankins moving down, but still on. Tommy Mace moving down. He might come off. Xavier Curry uh, moving up. Doug Nick Casey's moving down. Maybe off as well. Uh, Peyton Beatonfield moving down. Carson Tucker, honestly, he's not in my top 30. It's just he hasn't been able to stay healthy. Uh, and then we talked about Angel Martinez, the only other guy I didn't talk about, and he's kind of in those teens. Where do you slot a chase to lotter? Like, I love the ceiling. I love the five-tool potential. There's a lot of risk. I can't slot him in the top 10 over guys in AA and AAA. Right now, like I said, John Kenzie Noel is probably 11th or 12th. Levestita is the other guy. Those are my top 12. And the lotters may be 13th. Justin Campbell is probably somewhere around 20. And then no one else cracks it. I, it's just, it's hard with the depth in this system. So the Guardian's in a weird place. Like often a question I'll see is like, okay, so which teams drafted their new number one prospect? The Guardians to me, and you watch when he, uh, after he signs, they'll slot him into the MLB list. And Callis and Maya, Mayo and the people at MLB are fantastic. They do an impossible job. There's a lot of outside support. And I remember back in the day when it was only Mayo there. And, like, he just had an impossible job. <laughs> I remember the little, like, you click the little, like, preview, and it just was, like, almost like a slideshow. Uh, Robbie Goble in the top ten, just because he had a seven-figure bonus type of deal. The latter will be in there because he's a first-round pick. But I don't think he should be because, again, Will Brennan, to me, should be in the top ten players. I, I The fact he's not, I go, what? If you re I think they re-racked this recently, or maybe it's just everywhere else did. But there's no way Bo Naylor isn't in the top 10. So it's people ask me that question, but I just I don't see how you move any of those other guys out. Let me know what you think. Am I wrong? Am I misjudging this? He's a very exciting player with a big risk, big reward. But can you really move out a guy in the upper minors performing well? On that list of guys, who is not performing well? Gabriel Arias, who was injured. Oh, go check the numbers. He's actually played better of late since he's starting to get reps down there. It's a brutal list. Yeah, maybe Nolan Jones graduates off. Um but who else is going to graduate off like from those top players? Who's the guy? Most of these guys haven't even played in the big leagues. It's like uh, Jones is the only player from that top 10 list. I've, and, and Arias, my bad, Arias, who, uh, who have done that. Everyone else, we're still waiting. Lavastida, who's like 11th to 12th, is your other one. Uh, so it's going to be interesting. We're going to take our break. We haven't even talked about any of the draft picks themselves in depth. We're going to get into some of the interesting ones in terms of performance, some of the interesting ones in terms of uh, just you know ceiling and where they would rank. Like we're just doing a pure like ranking list of the drafted players. 
all on today's, and we'll get into the nicknames as prop, not nicknames, top five draft names so far this year on today's Locked On Guardians. Our sponsor, our good friends at Bilt Bar. I currently have in my hand a birthday cake Bilt Bar. And I just want to point out, when I pull back the little thing here, you can't see it, three grams of fat, carbohydrates, how about 15 grams? How about my fiber? I was, oh, this one doesn't have the fibers. Often they're high in fiber as well. That's always what I underrated. Protein, 16 grams. Now, if you do get birthday cake, they currently don't have them, so I'm just going to taunt you. Make sure you shake it a bit, get it at the bottom. This is what a boat bar actually looks like. That's right. It's got like sprinkles, like birthday cake on it. Uh, you can see those right in there. Maybe I should pull it back. And what better ad than just, you know, it's a protein bar, but it's delicious. All protein bars, a little bit chewy, but compared to most, not that bad. <laughs> I feel like sometimes I'd bite and have to like wrench them. Not built bars. Nice soft tune, it's, it's gone. Fantastic product. I love my built bar. I use my promo code LOCK15. This podcast is over. I'm finishing this as a, a late evening treat. Go to BuiltBar.com, promo code LOCK15. Uh, it's, I love them. I've been buying them for three years. I want to buy toffee almond, but I got I got these still. And they just sent me some in the mail. So I love you, Built Bar. If you try it, you'll love them as well. Remember, that's promo code LOCK15, BuiltBar.com. A in my heart, A in my health food app. Let's actually talk about the guys in depth they drafted. So should we start with the first pick, Joe Lampe? From uh, and of course I closed out my baseball cube tab on Joe Lampe. Uh, he is from Arizona State. Here is my issue with. I'm sure he's a great dude. I am sure he uh, has you know, everything. A lot of great. Like he's a center fielder in the Cape. He posted amazing on base percentage, but had two extra base hits. Um, and yeah, he has some production. I think is it on this computer because I got both computers going. Yeah, amateur draft picks from Arizona State, because they, they've had almost 400, but only 100 have hit the big leagues, and only 15 have produced a war of 15 or greater. Barry Bonds is the greatest, followed by Reggie Jackson, Sal Bando, Dustin Pedroia, Rick Monday. And it's funny, because after Monday is Floyd Bannister and Bob Horner, so you actually have three number one overall picks in a row there. Uh, Andre Ether, Ethier is, is after those guys, and then if you're curious, Larry Gura, and then Jason Kipnis. So it's, you see a lot of production that guys don't match. A lot of disappointing performances from high picks. Hunter Bishop comes to mind uh, in the past few years. And those Arizona guys, it, it always concerns me. Yeah, he hit 12 home runs this year with 22 doubles and three triples. But in the Cape, one double, one triple, zero home runs and 108 plate appearances. Uh, he didn't strike out too much. He walks at a good rate. Now, that was in the Cape. He, his walk rate is okay. His strikeout percentage is fantastic. He's probably a fourth outfielder. I don't know, like the bonus, I, I have a hard time imagining he gets full slot, especially with the other players they have drafted. So I think it could be an under slot thing. I think there's a very good chance he's a, a platoon bat or a fourth outfielder. But that's why I wasn't, you know, he's 106 on the MLB big board. They liked him quite a bit. I just didn't see that profile there. I, I see a backup Likely. I just don't think there's any power at all. And I know you're like, but you like Chandler Simpson. Chandler Simpson, though, had that one elite trait. He had that groundbreaking speed in 80. Lampy's like a 60 speed, a 50 defend. They list 45 power. I don't, again, the 12 home runs, but I would really need to see those bounced out between where they were hit and how many were in Arizona itself. So I'm just not sold on there being enough power to make him necessarily a starter. Fine selection. And does some things very well. Like his on base percentage, in spite of the fact that, like, he didn't have 416 in the Cape. So there, but he wasn't like that top end Cape performer like we've talked about recently. So that was, you know, it was, it's fine. It, it's not a pick that really blows you away. Uh, some people like them a little bit more than others. I, I'm looking for elite traits often or something that I feel like can carry a guy. And I just didn't see that one with him. Uh, let me. My mouse is not functioning. Apologize for that. Pause real quick. Now I have everything lined up. So what's interesting to me is the Guardians took two players that were draft eligible sophomores. We've talked about how they really haven't done that recently. And then they took a 19-year-old high school kid. Again, something they don't do. So when they do that, you really want to look at those guys. Even though Jacob Zibin 
Jordan Humphreys are the bigger names. I'll talk about them tomorrow, and again, we have multiple shows to get through this. So let's talk about the guys who go against type. Talk about Lamp, and again, I think Lampy's a fourth outfielder. I think he's a good chance to be a fourth outfielder. I just, in the third, was hoping for a little bit more. In the top 100 picks, I wanted a guy who I felt like could be a potential starter. Um, so first is Nate Furman, who was at a UNC Charlotte. Five foot eight, undersized guy, but he can run. Uh, you know, he did well in the Cape as well. Uh, in the Cape Cod last year, across, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this summer at the Cape Cod, 306, 387, 367. Ranked second on the club in hits, walks, and on-base percentage. Uh, fast, utility type. So let's see, he had uh, 21 stolen bases, tied for second in walks, stolen bases, and runs for small school guy, undersized. Let's see, he's got, uh, he's still 20 years old. No, he's 21. He'll be, he's almost 22. He's got, you know, they can put a few July birthdays here. But again, draft eligible sophomore. That makes sense. He wouldn't be 20 and, uh, uh, I guess he could be 20 and be a draft eligible sophomore. But he's, uh, yeah, I don't think he's a true one. Because that was kind of the eternal debate at some of the summer league stuff. So I don't think Furman is a true draft eligible sophomore. But the next guy, Guy Lincecum, is. Uh, he is. A, another, well, not a, another speed demon, and probably even more so. Like uh, like I said, uh, the, here's a great tweet. I was going to pull up Joe Doyle had one talking about, like, the speed on Furman. So he's, like I say, he's probably a utility type, probably an underslot sliding. I feel like Furman and Lampy are both maybe a little bit under their slot. Furman is up the middle, utility type, great speed. We come back, up the middle, utility type, great speed, lots of walks with Guy Lincecum, who stole 42 bases this year, a school record, and had a school record, the 406 batting average, as he was the Ohio Valley Conference of the Conference Player of the Year. First time a player from Belmont has ever claimed that award. Really interesting production for him. Like He played really well, two small school guys here. Potentially another under slot for the Guardians. And the third one... <laughs> that when they, you know, again, not to brag, I guess I should put up my uh, my little, uh-oh, victory lap coming. Uh, yeah, I, I am part of media. So the little write-up, like, they, they give a lot of information relative to all things. A lot of it's stat-based, uh, except for Javier, Javier Santos. There's, like, nothing. It is one sentence. It is the smallest amount I have seen on any player, uh, maybe ever, and part of the problem is he didn't even – he's a Georgia Premier Academy guy. If you listen to the broadcast, they talked uh, – Jim Callis mentioned that Daniel Espino had talked to him about Javier Santos. Like, I wonder, does Daniel Espino get the scouting credit on this pick? Uh, but, yeah, he's the same place that, that uh, Daniel Espino went. When I was reading about him, he didn't come over to the United States until 2022, so he hasn't even been here that long. Hard to scout him. Six feet tall, 190 pounds. Turned 19 at the start of June. So he would have, he's, he's an old high school kid, just compared to, which they typically avoid. So when they go against type, pair of draft eligible sophomores, again, I think the, no, because he's, I looked at that, he's 20, turning 21. Might be pair of true draft eligible sophomores. And then a 19-year-old high school kid. Those are, the last time they took a 19-year-old high school kid that I can recall was Connor Capel. And he got to the big leagues this year. So you know, that's a good thing to look at. Santos is, has a 97-mile-an-hour fastball and then a usable slider, and that's it. He is a bit of a blank slate. There's something they like there, and again, really can fling it at 97. Uh, small kid, 6 feet, 190. So there's, a, you know, he's clay, and clay in the hands to mold, I think, for them. And he was, you know, one of the more interesting picks until the 8th and 10th round when they took the big dams. And we're going to get to those players tomorrow. We're going to talk about the rest. We talked about, you know, the third rounder, the top, last of the top 100. We talked about the guys who went against type. Five best names. Okay, ready? Here's your part. If you don't want kind of the immaturity of this, I understand. But here we go. Make sure I have these all right here in my head. I want to pause and make sure I write these down formally so I can do them in the correct order. So at five came from my uh, my show partner, Lindsey Crosby, Caden Trankel. At four, we have Gary Gilhill. Then we had Orion Kirking, Kirkering, who I, I brought up on the show for this. Two, Brad Cumbest, and one, Zebulon Vermillion, who I believe 
uh, extort vapor farmers on or uh, yeah, uh, water farmers with their vaporators. Can't remember, man, I'm losing it uh, on Tatooine in his off time. Those are the fun names to end on something fun for this draft class. What am I saying? This draft class. We still got day three tomorrow. We still got half of the players they took today to really get in the weeds on. I, like I said, we didn't even talk about, I mean, to most people's view, the top two prospects they drafted on day two. We got uh, 14 more players. We're going to get into all of it because I love it. I live it. I breathe it. Thank you for checking out Lockdown Guardians. I've been your host, Jeff Ellis. Remember to rate and review download daily. Oh, we're so close. Okay, team. We were the 11th by Charitable, the 11th best podcast, 68th overall among baseball, 11th best in network at 61 is the Tigers. Tigers always beat us. Always, always, always. So come on, listeners. Do you want to lose the Tigers? We're finally beating the White Sox. We're losing to the Twins. We're beating the Royals. But come on, Tigers, help, help us out. Keep going. Remember to download daily. Uh, I think I have more reviews. I got to thank everyone for those. We're so close. So team, get together. Almost cranked the top 10. That close. And then the one time we did crack it, I then had to, to take off and <laughs> take a mini vacation last time. So we'll see. This is draft week. I'm expecting huge numbers. Next Monday, crack the top 10. Download daily, rate and review. It helps. And as I end every show, go, go, Guardians, go.